I greet you in the name of Christ, whether it's morning for you or evening or afternoon, but here we are again to worship our great God and doing so via the internet. Uh, today, uh, Pastor Chris is going to lead us in a study of St. Mark, because yesterday was the feast day of St. Mark the Evangelist, the writer of one of our Gospels, so we'll be talking about that. And because we are still in the Easter season, we say, the Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Pastor Chris. Yeah, I'm excited to, to learn a little bit more about Mark together. Uh, he's a man of action, so obviously one of my favorite biblical characters. And uh, you'll find out more why I'm in a little bit. So uh, we, we're excited about being able to worship together again, even though in this new format. So we begin our worship with confession and absolution. We are using Divine Service Setting 4 in the Lutheran Service Book, which begins on page 203. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together, as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking His grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, merciful Father, in holy baptism, you declared us to be your children and gathered us into your one holy church in which you daily and richly forgive us our sins and grant us new life through your spirit. Be in our midst, enliven our faith, and graciously receive our prayer and praise through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We now sing uh, hymn 475 in your hymnal, Good Christian Friends Rejoice and Sing.
peace. Let us pray to the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. Defend us, gracious Lord. Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. Isaiah chapter 52 beginning at verse 3 for thus says the Lord you were sold for nothing and you shall be redeemed without money for thus says the Lord God my people went down at the first into Egypt to sojourn there and the Assyrian oppressed them for nothing now therefore what have I here declares the Lord seeing that my people are taken away for nothing their rulers wail, declares the Lord, and continually all the day my name is despised. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, in that day, they shall know that it is I who speak. Here I am. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. The voice of your watchmen 
They lift up their voice. Together they sing for joy. For eye to eye they see the return of the Lord to Zion. Break forth together into singing, you waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Our psalm today is Psalm 116, also found in the front part of your hymnal. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy, because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold of me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believe, even when I spoke, I am greatly afflicted. I said in my alarm, all mankind are liars. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. The epistle reading is from the first letter of Peter, chapter 5, beginning at verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. My Silvanus, a faithful brother as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is in Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings. And so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with the kiss of love. Peace to all you who are in Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Deliver. 
delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things have happened. Moreover, some of the women in our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning when they did not find the body. They came back saying that they had seen visions of angels who said he was alive. Some of these who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted them all the scriptures and all the things concerning himself. So they drew near to, the, near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going further. But he urged with them strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is towards the end of the day, and it is now far spent. So he went to stay with them. When he was at his table with them, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were open, they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road and while he opened up the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and those who were with them together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. And they told what happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. Christ. This is the time in our service where normally we'd invite the children to come up for a message, um, but, but we're going to record it so the kids can still participate at home. But Pastor Chris has got to get something real quick. Are you scared yet? You should be. No, it's just Pastor Chris. And this is a Halloween mask, and I know Halloween is like six months away, so how in the middle of April can we be thinking about Halloween? Well, in our, when we learned about St. Mark today, we learned that St. Mark ends the story of Jesus with the people that see Jesus are afraid, and they don't know what to do. Well, kids, right now there's a lot of fear in the world. And maybe you're just afraid because you can't go out as much or you're, you're but you know, some, some, some people are afraid because of jobs, some people are afraid because of money, some people are afraid of getting sick. This is, this is a different time in the world, and I'm sure as you talk to your parents, they'll say that they've never experienced anything like this. So, you kids are growing up in a very different, interesting time, and with that comes a lot of fear. But just like you don't have to be afraid of Pastor Chris with this Halloween mask, you don't have to be afraid of what's going on out there because during this Easter season especially, we're reminded that Jesus went to a cross to remind us that even when we are afraid, that he is with us. So let's take that message with us and maybe you can even say that to your parents, remind them that don't be afraid, Jesus is with us. Amen? Amen. We continue with our Song of the day, stay with us. Thank you. 
Grace, mercy, and peace be from God our Father as we meditate on His Word this morning, especially in, in remembrance of the uh, festival of St. Mark. Amen. As Pastor Andy said at the beginning, we are going to look at the, uh, the person of, of St. Mark, the, 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 the person who wrote the second gospel chronologically that shows up in our Bible and, and most likely the first one written as we'll get to here in a second. So his festival day in the, in the, in the church calendar was, was yesterday, it was Saturday. But, you know, I think it's kind of interesting every once in a while to take a message uh, from the perspective of, of one of, especially one of the key figures of the faith. And it's, in Mark, you know, even though he shows up a few places in the Bible, as we'll see, kind of like, you know, the only, really, of the, of the people who wrote the four Gospels, John is the only one that we really see a whole lot in the Bible outside of kind of what they wrote. So kind of like kind of like the others, kind of like Matthew, kind of like Luke, we don't really know a lot about St. Mark. Just be stoked. Um, but we know a few things. So for example, uh, we, we see in Acts chapter 12, um, we see it's, it's kind of our first time that we see anything on St. Mark. And in Acts chapter 12, we see uh, the story of Peter. It says, when Peter came to himself, this is right after he'd been miraculously free from jail, he said, now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel to rescue me from the hand of Herod and from all the Jewish people were expecting. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other's name was Mark. So this is the first time we see that the person that we know as John Mark John is his Hebrew name, uh, Mark being his Greek name, so he kind of goes by both, and those are interchangeable. Uh, his mother was Mary, and not any of the Marys involved in the Gospels that we know of. Mary, as, as Pastor Randy said a couple weeks ago, was a very common name back then. So, you know, there's a lot of people named Mary, so it just happened to be, be the same name. But what, what's interesting is we see a couple things here. That he was a club, that, that, that he was associated with Peter pretty early on, and Peter, even in the, in the Acts, and then after Peter was miraculously freed from prison, the first place he went was to the house of Mark. And, John, and so this idea that Mark and his family were key members, key people in the early church is kind of shown here. And then this association with Peter is, is further developed in the, in the epistle reading that, that Randy read a few minutes ago, where towards the end of that it says, she who is in Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends her greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Greet each other with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. So there, we see that not only, you know, is, is he someone that's known by Peter, we see he's calling him his son. And then that's showing, a, and this is several years later, but we're seeing that this relationship between Mark and Peter developed over time and to the point where we're out of respect for the relationship, even though they were not biological father and son, he viewed Peter like a son. And no doubt Peter viewed Peter viewed Mark viewed Peter as well like a father. We, we see that kind of honor. Even like today, um, Pastor Joseph from our fourth service calls Pastor Randy Papa. And, and, and it's kind of this form of respect, you know, and as they've developed this bond, and he looks up to him as a as an older pastor, and, and so we see kind of that that going on here. So, and, and this is important because we generally understand that and we'll talk about this a little bit more later as well. But we generally understand that the Gospel of Mark is told from the perspective of Peter, since Mark wasn't there, he wasn't one of the twelve disciples, he wasn't a part of that when the apostles. We, we understand that he got most of his information through the lenses of Peter. So that, that's... Um, now, Mark um, is, is a guy that, that kind of got himself in a little bit of trouble in, in the early church. Um, he, he, in addition to his relationship with Peter, um, he also was a traveling companion of Paul and Barnabas. They went on their first missionary journey. And, and we see that this created some, some conflict because they, they, they were going off on their, on their journey at some point. We don't know the whole story. We don't know why, but it just says Mark left and, and went back to Jerusalem. He, we don't know if he, got a, if he got scared, if he got tired, if he just wasn't 
up for the challenge or whatever. And then later, uh, Paul and Barnabas are getting ready to go on another journey. And, and we read this, this account. And it kind of gives some really good information on, on kind of the background of Mark and what we learn about him. It says this. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let's return and visit the brothers in the cities where we had proclaimed the Lord before and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark. But Paul thought it best not to take him because he had withdrawn with them before and had not gone with them to finish the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers for the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Sicilia, strengthening the churches. Now, I know it's shocking for you to think that there was actually conflict in church way back then. I mean, so it's, we're not, it's not unique to us today, but this is a pretty, pretty severe conflict. Paul and Barnabas were... You know, Barnabas had been kind of Paul's, the guy that had kind of legitimized him and, 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 and brought him into the fold and had kind of been, you know, a, a big part of Paul's bridge, you know, kind of from Saul to Paul. And they just, Barnabas wants to give Mark a second chance. And Paul's like, no, I don't trust this guy. And they end up saying, okay, they end up parting ways. And, and what, what's great is that sometimes even when people split like this over the gospel, it actually, they ended up going on two journeys. So it, it actually doubled the work. So, and, and later we do see that, that he regained the trust of Paul. That, that Paul and Mark are reconciled. And, and even in a couple of his own letters, just like Peter does, Paul references Mark and, his, and the importance of Mark. So we see Mark then becomes a pretty significant figure in the early church. You know, he's, he was a travel companion of both Peter and Paul and Barnabas. And, and so he was a, a guy that, that, that had a, a lot of, even though we don't see a lot of the stories of him, he was kind of around in all of this. Um, there is one interesting story of Mark that, that could be Mark in, our, in the gospel story. Um, when Jesus is, you know, arrested and all the disciples flee and Jesus is being taken, you know, in to be questioned, there's this, this couple of verses that only appear in the Gospel of Mark. And it says this. It says, A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. So this, this young, this kid, this white teenager, found, you know, uh, understood that Jesus was about to be arrested, or he heard that Jesus got arrested, and he, he hastily got dressed and went out to see what was going on. And he kind of was trying to keep his distance with the, the guards found him and they tried to grab him and he slipped away and, and whatever. What's interesting about that story is that, once again, it only shows up in the Gospel of Mark. And since the other disciples had fled, you know, who else would have known this story? So a lot of people say that that's Mark telling the story about himself. Now, we can't prove it, but it, it, it's a long history of the church that says that's probably Mark, like, not wanting to fess up that it was him, but it's like him including kind of in a passive way that that was him. So, the point is, though, that there's this tradition that Mark was kind of involved in this stuff from the beginning. Uh, the tradition of the church says that he served churches in Egypt, uh, and specifically he's tied to the Church of Alexandria as the founder of that church, likely the first bishop of that church. Um, and it also has a strong association with Rome. The, the Gospel of Mark is generally understood to be have written in Rome, and, and and, and he was a part of the leadership of the church there. So one of the things we learn about Mark is that he's kind of this guy that's always in the middle of the action. Like I said before, maybe that's why I like him so much. He's my kind of guy. And sometimes he's getting in trouble but, because he gets a little too close to the action. Um, probably had a little addiction to chaos like myself or whatever. But he's always kind of in the middle of the action. And we see that it, it kind of played out even in his, his telling of the gospel. So, and really like, like the other gospel writers, we learn a lot about Mark from what he wrote in his gospel. Now, once again, some of this is obviously the account of Peter, another guy of action, probably why they, they developed such an affinity for each other. Um, but we, we learn quite a bit about Mark just from the, the themes of his gospel, what makes his gospel unique. For example, Mark is the shortest gospel. It's only 16 chapters long. 
So, and it's, and it's the gospel is full of action. It's just one event after another, after another, after another. The word that we translate immediately in English, or, or so, somewhere close to immediately, shows up over 40 times in the book of Mark. It's 16 chapters, so he's like, Jesus did this, Jesus did that. Jesus, and, and he always shows, Jesus is always on the go. I mean, there, there's a great sense of urgency in Mark. Um, Mark really focuses more on Jesus' power through what he did. So not as much about his teaching and things like that, but more about what, what especially his miracles. So we, we see this theme throughout Mark of, of Jesus showing his power over nature and, 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 and then showing his power over, you know, over sickness and death itself and even death on the cross and then finally showing his Jesus shows his power over the enemy and over, over uh, evil and, and, and over, over the devil as well. So we see this, this, this Jesus is a man of action and Jesus you know, is, is this man of power. He also, it's interesting, left Mark, and all the gospels do this a little bit, but Mark especially, Jesus will do a healing miracle and then tell the person not to say anything. He'll even cast out a demon and tell the demons not to tell anybody. So there's this kind of secrecy around what Jesus is doing. He doesn't want to get the word out too soon. And that, that, that comes out in Mark. Um, well, there's this presence of the masses surrounding Jesus. It seems like the crowds are following Jesus wherever he goes in Mark. And he has, he's having a hard time getting away from them. Uh, that, that, that's part of why we kind of think he's telling people not to tell. But he's trying to kind of focus on other things like, like, like teaching his disciples, which is another key part of Mark. We we see Jesus always, even in the midst of all this craziness and, 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 and energy and, and going, 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 he's always taking the time to go back and explain to the disciples what's going on. So he's preparing them for what's going to happen next. And also we see Jesus expressing his emotions in Mark. We see him angry, we see him tired, we see him, you know, all the, all, so we see this very human side of Jesus through this expression of his emotions in Mark. Now, interestingly enough, some of these things that, that we, we think of when we think about the gospel of Jesus or the story of Jesus, if you read the book of Mark, and it's only 16 chapters long, so I really encourage you to read the book of Mark cover to cover, you know, this week. It is, it's a really interesting read of the, of, of the life of Jesus, the story of Jesus. <clears throat> but when you do that, there's going to be some things in there that you're like, wait, why didn't Mark include this? For example, there's no birth there. There's no baby Jesus in Mark. In fact, Mark starts his gospel kind of what we talked about before. They're just, he's ready to go. Boom. In the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ the Lord, and then we go straight into John the Baptist. I mean, there's no, there's no kind of buildup. It's just, you know, action, ready, action, go. I mean, with, with Mark. So we see that. Very few parables, very few uh, sermons that are lengthy teachings, the teachings are short to the point. Um, almost no references to the Old Testament. So he's, he's, he's probably writing to more of a Greek audience and, he, and a more of a Gentile audience. And he's not trying to confirm, he's not trying to convince uh, a Jewish audience in, in that sense. So there's not a whole lot of references to the Old Testament. Uh, there's not a lot of predictions of future events, especially in times or the second return of Christ. So there's, there's a very present and a, a very immediacy of what's going on in Mark. And then finally, almost nothing on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We don't see very many references to, to the, the, the Spirit of God to come or that kind of stuff. So, now I want to close with this because I think what's one of the most unique things about Mark, and this, is, this gets read in another years on Easter morning, is his account of Easter morning. Now, if you, if you look at Mark in your Bibles, you will notice that Mark ends at verse 16 verse 8. And then there's a little note that says the most reliable early manuscripts and other witnesses do not have Mark 16, 9 to 20. So there's a lot of debate about that. Why does Mark end his gospel where he does? Because as we're going to read this in a second, he ends it in a really strange place. Um, and so most people say either Mark later or someone else in the church later just like couldn't handle, it's, it's kind of like a cliffhanger in a movie or whatever. He just leaves us hanging, and they had to go back and add that. But we're, we're going to treat Mark today as though Mark intentionally ended where he did, and we're going to wrestle with why. So let me read this real quick. The the Mark uh, chapter 16. So the, this is the 
Easter account according to Mark. It says, When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb, and they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And they looked up and saw the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And they said to him, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they lay him. But go tell the disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee, and there you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. They said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now, the word gospel means literally good news, right? And But Mark decides to end his gospel with confusing news, strange news, um, conflicting news, right? Like I said, it's like a cliffhanger. There, there we go. And someone said, no, Mark, you can't end it there. And they add this other stuff later, but no, that's where he ends it. So let's, let's break down this section real, real quick. It says, the ladies go to the tomb with spices. That's the story. They, and when we see that, that's confirmed in other gospels. And they show up and, they, and they're wondering, okay, who's going to roll away around the stone so we can put these spices on Jesus uh, for his body? And they realize, oh, wait, the stone's already rolled away. So how did that happen? And then this is their first kind of like, oh, well, this is strange. What's going on? And they get there and they see this man in white, most likely an angel. That's how we would normally interpret that. And he gives them this message. And, and he gives them this kind of, you know, the strange message. Hey, he's risen. He's not here. You know, look, look where they laid him. There's no, there's no body there. It's, it's, it, you know, and then he tells them to go tell Peter and the disciples that Jesus has already left. He's on his way to Galilee. You're going to find them there. But it's interesting how these ladies respond to this. They don't find comfort in those words at all. Now, now, 2,000 years later, we look back at those words, we find great comfort in them. But they were, it says literally that they freaked out. I mean, that's in the Greek, but they said that. It says that they freaked out. And they were overwhelmed with shock and fear. And they, they just left. They said nothing to, they didn't tell anyone. And they were afraid. Now, is that a strange place to end the gospel? With people afraid? Don't we want to be comforted by, you know, that the, they had this great faith and they had this great calm came over them and they were so excited that Jesus had, had risen that they just were calm and just couldn't wait to see him. No, that's not what it says at all. So, in that, in that sense, it's almost like Mark says, the ladies are afraid, the end. That's the end of the story of Jesus. And, of course, we know that and he wrote first. Like that. We, we pretty much believe that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Matthew, Luke, and John wrote after him, um, and, and they kind of filled in the gaps later. And, and maybe that's part of what, what what inspired somewhere along the line to add this ending to Mark to make it more kind of follow the, the ending of the others. But for whatever reason, Mark wanted this to he wanted he intentionally ended the story right here. And it, it was, and I was reading this this week, and as I was studying Mark, and as I was getting ready for this message, I was like, what a perfect gospel for the time that we're living in right now, right? Because if someone, like, was writing the story of, of the world, and, and ended it, at, you know, in March or April 2020, they would end it probably in a similar world, in a similar way. The whole world is afraid. The whole world is freaking out. The whole world is asking questions. We talked about that a couple weeks ago with the idea of lament, where you, you ask questions to God knowing that the answers aren't there. And, you know, five, six, seven, eight weeks into this, especially as far as the whole, you know, um, social distancing and all these measures that are taking place, we're not necessarily any closer to answers than we were then. Now, we, we believe the answers are coming, and we believe that things are going to get better, but we're also hearing this could take a couple of years. We're saying it could get worse before it gets better. We're saying they can open things back up and then have to close them back down because they start spreading again. They're saying we're a good year or more from a vaccine. And if we get a vaccine for this, who's to say that something worse won't come in a few more years? I mean, the point is, there's, there's fear in the world and that's where we're at right now. And, and sometimes we want to avoid the fear or we want to 
say that, well, if you have enough faith, you won't have fear. And yet no one's going to question the faith of Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and these ladies that were with Jesus all the time. So fear is okay. It's okay to be afraid. But don't let the fear overwhelm you. Don't let the fear stop you from living. Don't let the fear stop you from serving others. And don't let the fear stop you from living out your faith in a way that makes a difference in the lives of others. But when our fear grips us, that's when it's bad. Or that's when it's challenging. And that's why even later Peter will say, you know, perfect love drives out all fear. You know, God has not given us the spirit of fear. But fear is real. And we should embrace our fear. We should, we should even lean into our fear. We should talk to our kids and our, and our neighbors and, and even your pastors about your fears. But also, trust. Because that's the message that the angel gives the ladies. He is risen. He is not here. Go to Galilee and you will find him. And we do learn from the other Gospels that that's very what happens. They go to Galilee and they find him. We see in our other God, in the Gospel reading appointed today that the, the, the men on the road to Emmaus found him. And they, didn't even, they couldn't even see him at first because they were so distracted and distraught by all the events that had happened. So in, 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 in all of this fear that we are experiencing, and all this anxiety, and all this uncertainty, don't be so overwhelmed by it that you forget to see Jesus. That you forget to see the message of the cross, and to hear the hope that we have in that. Amen? Amen. Now we continue our worship with sharing uh, the words of the Nicene Creed, and, that, and these words... Um, Bind us to the church uh, throughout the world and throughout the ages. We confess together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God. Begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man. And he was crucified also for us in the conscious power. He suffered and was buried. On the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son and the others worship and glorify, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We continue with the prayer of the church. Let us pray. Gracious God. We praise your glory and majesty. We thank you for walking with us on this journey that we are on. We ask you to set our hearts on fire with love for you and others. We thank you for the evangelist, uh, St. Mark especially, who shared the story of your life, Jesus, with us, so that we might also take action in serving you and others. God, we ask that all that were affected by this coronavirus be held in your loving care. In this time of uncertainty and fear, help us to know what is ours to do. We know you did not cause this suffering, but that you are with us in it and through it. Help us to recognize your presence in acts of kindness, in moments of silence, and in the beauty of the created world. Grant peace and protection to all of humanity for their well-being and for the benefit of the earth. For those in isolation, we pray patience and courage to bear this time. 
especially our elderly parents and friends quarantined in nursing homes. We pray that you would keep them safe. For those in essential services, in the fields of medicine and safety and provision, grant them fortitude and strength, keep them healthy. For those who have lost employment or wages because of this pandemic, please provide for them the resources they need. And uh, help us to help those in need as well. We pray for you to hinder the spread of COVID-19 virus through our world, help people to exercise good sense and judgment in the way they deal with this virus. For those who will receive communion, bless them with pardon and peace. And for those among us who are ill and infirm, including Bob Andrus, Martin Benchot, Jim Rummel, Josh Eichstadt, we pray grant healing. We pray for the family of Takanya Spencer, our Early Learning Center director, on the death of her cousin who died of COVID-19. And we pray that you would grant comfort and peace to them. We pray all of these things in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now we continue with our offerings. Uh, again, if you were here, we would be uh, having the ushers come down the aisles with the offering plates, but uh, we just want to thank you right now for your ongoing support. Your tithes and offerings enable Bethel to carry out all of our ministries. So please consider to continue to give online via our website or by making a, a mailing check to the church office. Also, please note that we have a special love offering that we have set up. You can do that through the, the website or by mail, uh, especially to help White Rock Center of Hope and our, those who our fourth service knows of in need. Uh, if you wish to contribute to that, you may do that as well to this love offering. The words of Jesus, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So we worship the Lord with our offering.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We, we lift them, them to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is, is right, right to give him thanks and praise. praise. It is truly really good, light, and salutary that we should, at all times and in all places, give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. And most especially are we bound to praise you on this day for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, the very Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and bore the sins of the world. By his dying, he destroyed death. And by his rising again, he has restored to us everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
And now may this, the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, give you strength and preserve you in true faith and to life everlasting. Go in peace. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us to the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.